Welcome to Private Banking Strategies Podcast with Vance Lowe and Seth Hicks, your secret weapon to protect your assets and never have to start over financially again. Vance and Seth help high net worth individuals, families, business owners, and investors structure an asset-protected, tax-free fortress for their families. Learn how to keep what you earn and use the velocity of money to create your own private banking system. Join us on this journey as we explore the secret strategies of the rich and political elite and help you take total control of your financial security. Now, on to the show. Welcome back to another episode of Blockhash Exploring Blockchain, part two of our episodes here with Seth Hicks, the COO of Private Banking Strategies. Seth, welcome back on. How are you doing? Hey, thanks, Brandon. Thanks for having me back. Glad to be here, man. Appreciate your invitation and really looking forward to talking about stuff today. Likewise. For anyone watching, if you didn't see the last episode, go check it out. We talked about Seth and his background. We talked about private banking strategies and their seven pillars and what they are most focused on and trying to preserve wealth, build wealth, save your wealth, invest your wealth. Really a good you know, 10,000 foot overview for a lot of people. This episode is going to be a little bit more hyper focused. We're going to talk about the FDIC a little bit and the concern that they don't have the ability to really actually back the deposits you have in a bit of the cover up that they're doing around this. And it, I think it's important for people to know. Seth, do you want to kind of lead us into it? I can pull up the the, the article as well. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Well, yeah, th this kind of focuses our discussion point on pillar number one of private banking strategies, which is asset protection. And I mean, a fundamental concern should be for folks who have cash in, in centralized banks is, is it really safe? there. And we discussed a, a little bit and touched on in the first part of our podcast about, you know, how centralized banks engage in fractionalized lending, how 90% of your deposit is actually loaned out without you making any money on it. And there's a reserve of 10% or less kept in the bank in the event that you want your money out. So they pull, you know, 10 people's $10,000 if you come in and want your 100000 out. And they're banking on the fact that not everybody comes and wants their money out uh, mm -hmm. at the same time. That's when, but when people do, that's called a bank run. The consumers lost confidence in the bank and they go and they want their money out before they lose it. Well, you know, the next level of argument always is, well, it's FDIC insured up to $250,000. You know, some of our clients have a lot more than $250,000 in accounts, um, which is not insured, but I think the insurance is a nonsensical anyway. And the first you know, clue that I had to that Brandon was when I read an article by a Harvard economics professor and Harvard is generally a kind of a left leaning institution. It's mm -hmm. certainly, you know, recently more like that. So to find a, a Harvard economics professor saying that, no, the, the banking system is not a play, safe place for your cash, for your money was eye opening. And I paid attention to what he said. He had a million bucks in cash. And I think he, I don't recall exactly which bank and I don't want to smear any particular bank because they're all equally culpable, frankly. But he did the math on the deposits in the banking system. And currently, you know, as of this last year, the end of the fourth quarter, there were 23 trillion and no, I'm sorry, 20 trillion in cash deposits across American banking institutions and the FDIC on a good day may have a hundred billion on its balance sheet. So 20 trillion in deposits and a hundred billion to back those deposits. It's, it's dismally insufficient. And when you do the math, we're talking about less than a penny in actual ability to make good on those deposits. That's just simply not a safe place to keep your cash. And that's what Terry Burnham, the Harvard economics professor concluded. And, and that's why folks should, you know, begin to look for other alternatives regarding that. Now, 
We touched a little bit about fractional reserve banking and derivative lending. We talked about those things. And when you and I talk about it, Brandon, people go, oh, interesting. Okay. But when the FDIC's special committee, the, the, the thought leaders the, and the, con the actual controlling authorities in the FDIC say it themselves, mm -hmm. you should be paying attention. So I hit you with this article that was published last quarter, 2022, and it blew my mind. I, I watched this video multiple times to make sure I actually heard and understood correctly what they were saying, because they were saying that, hey, everybody in this room understands the FDIC is insolvent, but the general public should not and cannot know that fact, or it will lead to unintended consequences. And, you know, what are those unintended consequences? Well, catastrophic failure is, is one of them, a complete collapse of confidence in the banking system, which for someone who's educating themselves, they should already be aware of, and they should be looking for alternative places to store their cash. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's, it's, it's a travesty that we've got leaders and pretenders trying to deceive the public into thinking that the banking system is safe when they know it's not and when they know that people are going to get hurt. I mean, what do you think about that? No, absolutely. And not just the ordinary people too, but innovation and tech startups and venture capitalists like with SVV, with Silicon Valley Bank, when it went under, that was a very well-known VC bank. And that, that has hurt innovation in the U.S. tremendously because that was, that was very important for funding a lot of these startups that come out of Silicon Valley, especially on the West Coast in the United States. And, you know, it's been systemic sense, but it's very scary that you can see a bank like that that is, is popular and is well-trusted that just doesn't have the deposits when people go into the bank. And I think it was also, if I'm correct about this, it was exacerbated because the bank had invested a lot of those deposits as well into U.S. treasuries. And because of the nature of U.S. Treasuries being inversely related to Treasury rates and rates being raised, it also decreased the value of those. So now they have less money and they can't fund the deposits and the bank is just completely insolvent. And I think we mentioned last episode, you know, some of these execs knew ahead of time this was going to happen and they took their precautions and measures. I think the executives for Silicon Valley Bank are being investigated right now because they were pulling their money out and selling their stock like a week before this happened. It's, it's, these, it's like these people have, it is criminal and, the, and they have no desire to tell the general public or anyone that has their money there, you know, this is going to happen or even put out a cautionary process. You know, they just, you know, they're thinking about themselves. You know, this is a big, I don't want to throw all the banks under the bus. Not all banks are bad, but I mean, it's a big scheme in a lot of ways. You know, they take your money, they lend it out, they make money off of you. They don't really offer you much in return. And it, and it sucks when everyone wants to go get their money back. Um, right. You know, because if we all want to do it at the same time, it's not there. And, and that's exactly what we're, what we're going through right now. Mid-sized cap banks are being eaten, a lot, eaten up by the big banks, by JP Morgan, Bank of America. You know, the few that actually have money right now. But it, it, it can't continue at this rate. And that's why the FDC, FDIC had that meeting, you know, it's because right. they don't want people to panic because if people do panic, you know, it leads to this issue. So they want to sweep it on the rug as much as possible. Yeah, that's right. And it, it was shocking to me to actually see that that was published. You, you know, I thought, is this secret, you know, secret camera? Or is this some type of leak? You know, but it, it wasn't. It was almost like it was just shocking. Like I said, I had to listen to things two and three times to actually mm -hmm. digest it. And I mean, there's direct quotes that 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 I outlined. One of them was, you've got to think of the unintended consequences of taking a public that has more faith, full faith and confidence in the banking system than the people in this room do as one FDIC member noted, and that's in the article that we're going to link to this podcast so people can watch this for themselves. So they're saying, you know, we all know at this table who control the FDIC that this is an insolvent system. We can't back the deposits that are made. And how do we control this information? How do we deceive people into believing 
that it still should be trusted, that they should still should leave their cash in the banks. And they, they specifically talked about controlling the narrative in social media. And as there were absolutely going to be bank failures in the, on, on the horizon, which they predicted, and there mm-hmm. was Silicon Valley Bank, Signature Bank, you know, they, they predicted this. And many people are saying that that's only the beginning, that there's going to be more bank failures. And because of the system, the, the, the system of economics that this is built on, of spending, and fractionalized banking, derivative lending, it cannot sustain itself. It cannot prosper. And in every society and culture that this form of economics has been implemented, it has failed. And so people have to see the handwriting on the wall and, you know, take measures to protect themselves. Mm -hmm. Uh, And there are, uh, there are alternatives, there are options. And statistics show that even if a minority, a strong minority of Americans bank in a different fashion, like through life insurance contracts or through cryptocurrency or metals or all of those things, that the entire system won't implode. But when you've got a massive majority adoption and people that keep their head stuck in the sand and don't want to see the, the truth of the matter, which the FDIC acknowledges, then you've got you've only got yourself to blame, you know? Absolutely. And I think there's a lot of people looking for those alternatives right now. When SBV went down, gold treasuries, inflows for gold treasuries were the highest they were in years. Like eight hundred, you know, million dollars in like a single day, like flowing into into gold and gold treasury equivalents, as well as into Bitcoin. A lot of people are looking for alternatives to protect their wealth right now, and not just retail investors, but people that have a lot of money that you know traditionally rely on these systems. The banking industry is just way too um, fragile at the moment with Jerome Powell and his his happy trigger finger with with uh, with rates. And so I want to talk about that too. You know, maybe there's alternatives for people that want to store their money. Maybe they want to keep investing it. Maybe they want to save it. Maybe they want to compound it. Whatever it is, but they want to get away from the banks a little bit just because they're not stable. And at the same time, maybe they want something that's more uh, friendly to them, more privacy oriented, you know, something that isn't going to make their life such a hassle every single day. You know, what are you doing your, with your money? What are you spending it on? Why didn't you report this or that or, you know, whatever the case may be? Let's talk about that a little bit, too, because you had mentioned some some options to me. Yeah, absolutely. In part one, we touched upon the private banking strategies structure. And the cornerstone of that is a whole life insurance contract. It's particularly structured and negotiated with a very select group of different companies that engage in private banking transactions, which mean you you bring you can put money in and take money out and it grows and compounds in side that system tax-free. And like we said, when you put money in, the insurance company doesn't raise their hand and issue you any type of tax documentation that says, we've received this. And when you pull the money out, they don't raise their hand or issue any reports. It's financially private. Many of the ultra wealthy in America have used this a private banking contract for decades, the likes of John F. Kennedy, Nixon. You've got franchises like Ray Kroc, who created McDonald's. J.C. Penney's was created off of this system and structure. You've got so, so many entrepreneurs and ultra wealthy that are in the know and understand how to use this that it's really a no-brainer. And in fact, the Internal Revenue Code has a specific section 7702, which carves out the ins and outs of these transactions. So that's why it's a financially private transaction. You, there is no reporting on this. Now, unlike a retirement program where you've got a 401k and you decide, hey, I want to take this money out, but it's early, you're going to get a penalty for taking money out early. You're going to get a penalty for taking it out too late. And you're going to pay taxes no matter when you take it out. You're going to be taxed. And that is very different than the private banking strategies model where there is financial privacy. There is no tax event with the monies in or out. 
and you've got all that growth that compounds year after year uh, with no risk. There is no risk of it going backwards. So, you know, to me, the safest place on earth is in for cash is in a life insurance contract. Mm -hmm. And we talked a little bit about how there is no derivative lending. There is no fractionalized reserve. They are absolutely one to one on the balance sheet. And every dollar that's put in is accounted for. And th there's been no failure since the inception of the country with this methodology through the Great Depression, through the Civil War, through every other economic downturn, including including the you know 2008 mortgage crisis depression, so to speak. They pay dividends and there was an increase in value, never a decrease. So that's the safest place for cash. And then I'll just add to that when you actually use your cash that's in your banking system in these life insurance contracts to go and invest wisely, rather like we talked about with Ethereum and, and staking it, or whether it's a real estate property, or you want to start a business and you're, that you're successful with, you're amplifying that, that wealth curve. You're amplifying your ability to grow that wealth curve rather than just on a wing and a prayer, hoping the banking system doesn't collapse on you because you know that that's a fool's game that's a fool's game to just slit your money in a bank account where mm -hmm. it doesn't earn any money i mean you've got almost negative interest rates and fees even for the ultra wealthy there's no incentive to leaving it there and there's just such better alternatives that you can't you can't ignore them at this point did that story feel like it was about you do you feel like you are generating a lot of revenue, but are not moving forward as fast as you would like? Do you feel you should be making more progress toward your financial goals? Do you feel stuck? Let us help you get unstuck. Are you ready to take action and get your own private bank? Please call Private Banking Strategies at 817-200-4777 or visit us at www.privatebankingstrategies.com. There's a lot of people too, you know, that want these options, but they want it with crypto too. Like they really want to get outside of traditional finance. And I know that you guys have a relationship with a really good international boutique bro brokerage. Can you talk a little bit about what that consists of and maybe what some of the benefits are there for people that might want to also diversify into, into Bitcoin or crypto? Absolutely. Yeah, we've there. So, you know, traditional, the, the problem, I guess, that I, as I would, you know, relate it, Brandon, would be for traditional exchanges such as Coinbase, Binance, Gemini, and some of them that have fallen by the wayside. You know, there's been multiple problems. Is Are, are your coins safe on those exchanges, even for brief periods of time? And some people have gotten burned leaving them on there and not putting them on their own, uh, their own wallets. Their I'm, own I'm wallets. one of those people. <laughs> it's yeah. happened to me before. Because, you know, you don't want the inconvenience sometimes of like having to deal with it. And you're thinking, oh, you know, it's, it's safe. And you don't pull it off and you get burned. And probably like most people that have been, you know, in crypto for five years or more, you've probably gotten burned with some exchange that you didn't get stuff off of. I know I, I have and yep. as well. And so... Now look, they created Coinbase. Well, that's a lot more of like a gold standard for sure. And they're not absconding with people's coins or, you know, fly by night. But there are some significant drawbacks. In the last bull run, when adoption started to swell, people couldn't create accounts. And Coinbase restricted that flow into their account creation and and new people who want, who were just fomoing could not get in because it was restricted it was mm -hmm. it was this bandwidth you know when there was this much demand on it and so they they had locked that down then on top of that you had all of these restrictions with how much you could purchase or sell and how much usd you could pull in from your bank account into your coinbase and people missed you know, things that they that they wanted to take advantage of. They wanted opportunities that they couldn't take advantage of and they were locked out and they couldn't realize those opportunities. Well, with this boutique brokerage, there is no uh, barrier as regards to a ceiling 
of how much you can purchase or how much you can sell. We've been working with them for over uh, six years, going on seven years, and have had them holding tens of millions of dollars in USD without a glitch, had them uh, holding tens of millions of dollars in cryptocurrency across various client accounts, never had one single hiccup. You have a dedicated account manager who can, you email and say, hey, I want to purchase this. They let you know that they've got it. They're going to implement the trade and give you a confirmation and it's it's done. It's mm-hmm. a white glove surface that you uh, is just not paralleled anywhere else. And here's an important one too that I that I gets into some touchy subject matter which is with tax issues. Okay, mm-hmm. everybody knows that Coinbase was subpoenaed by the IRS and basically bullied into giving client information up and they refused and they went back and forth. But ultimately they gave up client information. We're at a certain threshold. So everybody who's used Coinbase has now been, you know, disclosed and divulged to the, to the IRS. And there is no specific bright line laws on these topics regarding the taxation of cryptocurrency. And we have clients that choose to do take certain uh, strategies and others that take different strategies. And that's, you know, according to their own comfort level. But we have lots of clients that, that are taking the position with legal counsel and with uh, that they're not going to pay taxes on cryptocurrency trades or, or gains. And mm-hmm. one of the things about this boutique, boutique brokerage is that they're under no obligation to report the transactions. And so they don't raise their hand and and tell anyone, hey, you know, we've this this person is traded this amount of crypto or liquidated or here's their account portfolio or their account records. None of that is a compliance obligation of this entity. Thus, many folks who are fighting the tax battles and trying to minimize or totally eliminate their tax, so-called tax liabilities with crypto and just with generally with income, uh, they they want to use private firms. They want to use private mm-hmm. brokerages that enable them to transact that business in a financially private way. So, I mean, that's a mouthful, but what follow-up questions do you have about that? Because there's, there's a lot of value to, yeah. to the brokerage. Yeah, I do. A couple of things before that. First off, for those in the audience, please talk to your accountant and your CPA and don't just not pay the IRS. You know, be, be smart. Like these are stories, people that have put in, you know, a lot of thought and time into the decisions they're making um, that have proper guidance, that have, you know, quite a bit of money deployed at these things. So don't just not pay your taxes, you know, you know, do everything legally, but understand the legal options you have and the processes and your liberties. And, and go about it accordingly. And then just real quickly, I have a story too. I, I had like five or 600 Litecoin like seven or eight years ago, a long time ago on an exchange, some random exchange. And the the owners of that exchange, I found out like shortly after had been laundering all the money and whatnot. And so they went to jail, got arrested and the exchange got shut down and, and lost those funds. Uh, very, very unfortunate situation. So I I definitely can kind of relate to a lot of people out there that have a little bit of insecurity with the way things are going, especially in the U.S. with KuCoin and Binance and Coinbase being attacked and Bittrex having to go under. God, Bittrex has been around forever. It's like an OG exchange in the U.S. So there's a lot of uncertainty. And these are really good options like the boutique exchange that Seth is talking about. And make sure to do your due diligence on it and look into it, make sure it's the right option for you. But these are good alternatives if you really want to kind of get away from some of the problems that are festering right now, especially in the United States. If someone wants to set up an account, if they want to, you know, get something under their belt, do should they go through you with this process? Should they contact them directly? What's like the path forward? Yeah, we've got a special relationship with, with them and we help our clients set up accounts if they so choose. And generally, you know, people want to, to, to create accounts in, in the form of entities and manage those entities. And there's reasons and structures for that. So many times we will set up entity structure on the accounts and help them facilitate that. You know, the 
the pros of, of this type of service are that you you've got a legal leg to stand on and you've got the the ability of, of counsel with you. And so that's, you know, people can choose their own path and they can obviously do their own things. It's kind of like legal zoom. Do you, you know, sophisticated mm-hmm. people don't form their LLCs on legal zoom. <laughs> and there's right. a lot of re- reasons for that. So you need to have a team of experts around you and the sophisticated counsel is, is one of those things. And this is, this is boutique especially applies for those who are wanting that type of white glove service and that want to be able to, you know, ping their account manager and say, I want, you know, want to make this trade now. They don't have to log into exchanges. They don't have to do anything special. They don't, you know, you don't hit any roadblocks within that. They're not cut off. If they want to place a million dollar trade or a $10 million trade, the brokerage can do that and without a hitch. So, and I think, frankly, man, as we encounter this next bull run, there's going to be a table rush, so to speak. There's going to be mm-hmm. people trying to push in and, I, you know, you don't want to be caught out when when the train's moving. You want to be on the train. So the time to set the things up is is now and be glad to have discussions with folks about this. So when they hit us up on that, on our website or whatever, and they, they can put a little comment in there, hey, I'd like to talk to Seth about the brokerage or something like that. And then we'll, I'll know that they'll want to have a discussion about that. And I'd be glad to help them. But there's no obligation, uh, you know, and there's no cost to them to set that up. Uh, That's an important fact, you know, it's like, well, how much does this cost if we utilize you? You you don't, but we have an established relationship that's born the the test of time over closing in on seven years. So we have some preferential treatment. We have access to authorities within that brokerage that other common folks don't have. We have the ability to pull trades and, and do some things that other folks don't have access to do. For sure. What if someone wanted to set up one of these brokerage accounts with like a business entity or they want to do it with a trust? Do they have options to maybe go down that pathway as, as well and maybe set up maybe a more well-structured system? Yeah, you got it. You nailed it right on the head. Yeah, absolutely. That they're, they're able to use the trust implementation and that's what most of the clients prefer to do is utilize a, a trust for the the account setups and i mean i think most sophisticated traders are trying to migrate away from personal ownership of those accounts and doing it in official capacities and their asset protection reasons there are other structural benefits to doing it that way which are valuable Mm -hmm. very cool Awesome. Yeah. So we'll put some links in description for this specifically as well. If people want to learn more about this boutique brokerage, if they want to talk to you, Seth, and kind of figure out how to set this up, as well as maybe they want to chat about what's going on with the FDIC and bank deposits, a huge issue right now. I'm sure people have a lot of questions and I'm, I believe this is an episode we probably could expand even longer if we really needed to. So many things to talk about, but no, thank you for taking the time coming back on and discussing something that's very important right now in the U.S. and I think concerns that a lot of investors have, big and small. Yeah, absolutely. My pleasure. And I'll, I'll just reiterate, like we did on the, the first part, that the the ebook that we offer it addresses some of these issues about banks not being a safe place to store cash, how there's alternatives, how you want to capture compounding growth, which you can capture in, in policies. And so when folks you know hit us up and come to our website, we that free book offer, you can read it or listen to it. It's what the banks don't want you to know. And you listen or to that. And if that resonates with you, listen to a few podcasts that we've produced. And there's topics that are outlined and, and titled there that meet different you know aspects of what we're talking about. And if that's resonating with you, then from there, you can schedule an exploratory call where we lay out the systems for you. But I mean, I guess the main the f- summary point on this part is that for cash assets, cash value that you have under your control, you don't want to store that in centralized banks. And you want to find alternatives that are safe 
and that are growing and compounding that you can use and utilize to create financial freedom in your life. Absolutely. Should I just go to the website to get a hold of the ebook and to listen to some of those episodes? Exactly. Yeah. It's okay. privatebankingstrategies.com. It's so private banking strategies, IES.com. And therein you, you'll see the free book offer pop up and you can, like I said, listen to it or read it, download it, read it at your leisure. Some people, you know, are, are readers and more people in, in growing up today are listeners. They're going to listen to things on the move. So we wanted to make that easy enough for folks to digest in either way. And then we're going to send you valuable content that continues to explain some of these issues and email campaigns. But most folks want to dive into specific topics that are outlined in the podcast. And, 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 you know, we have the, the, a lot of binging, a lot of binging going on. So right. we've tried to make it easy for folks to really get in. And if you haven't heard of these things before, a lot of times it's like, I, you know, you're on that, you're, you're on a curve to really dig in. So we've tried to make that available for folks to be able to do. Awesome. Yeah. We'll have everything again in the description for the episode and we'll share it directly with as many people as we can. So guys, make sure to go check that stuff out. And Seth, thank you for coming back on. I really appreciate the time that you take to do this. It's very informative, I'm sure for a lot of people and helps them out with, with this issue. So thank you. Yeah. My pleasure, Brandon. Did that story feel like it was about you? Do you feel like you are generating a lot of revenue but are not moving forward as fast as you would like? Do you feel you should be making more progress toward your financial goals? Do you feel stuck? Let us help you get unstuck. Are you ready to take action and get your own private bank? Please call Private Banking Strategies at 817-200-4777 or visit us at www.privatebankingstrategies.com.